Okay, so welcome everyone to the um, session after the coffee break about MPC and proofs. So the first talk will be a complete characterization of broadcast and pseudo signatures from correlation. Um, the talk will be given by Barun um, and it's joint work with Binot, um, Prabhakaran, um, Nehia Shangwan and Shun Watanabe. So. Thank you, Carla. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this talk. Uh, so in this work, uh, we characterized the set of all three-wise correlated sources that can be used to realize three-party Byzantine broadcast. Uh, we will also see the implications of this result to n-party broadcast and MPC, and also its implication to a closely related notion called uh, pseudo-signatures. So let me begin by describing the Byzantine broadcast problem. There are n parties, of which one party that we call the sender has a single bit message m that it wants to send to the rest of the parties. The parties are connected by a uh, communication network that is synchronous. And the, the, the question is whether we can build a protocol that securely, uh, that securely guarantees the following properties against an adversary that is maliciously correcting a subset of parties. So the first condition is that if the sender is honest, then we want all the honest uh, parties to output M at the end of this protocol, where M is the input of the sender. And if the sender is malicious, then we want all the honest parties to agree on the same output, say M hat, at the end of this protocol, but we don't insist on what the value of this M hat is. So this is a fundamental problem in distributed uh, computation, and it has application to secure multi-party computation, blockchains, fault-tolerant distributed storage, and so on. So a classic result uh, in distributed computation says that uh, Byzantine broadcast is possible among n parties if and only if strictly more than two-thirds of those parties are honest. So specifically, uh, amongst three parties, broadcast is impossible even when one of the parties can be malicious. In this talk, we will be looking at uh, using some setup to get around this impossibility. So there is a long history of using uh, setups like stochastic resources to get cryptographic primitives. So uh, resources like noisy channels and correlated sources can be used to uh, build uh, protocols with uh, unconditional security. Some notable examples of this are uh, secret key agreement and privacy amplification using noisy channels and correlated uh, sources. Use of oblivious transfer correlation to realize MPC. Uh, use of noisy channels to realize bit commitment, and so on. Indeed, uh, in order to realize three-party broadcast, uh, previous works have used stochastic resources. A work from 2022 used uh, a noisy single input multiple output channel to realize broadcast. And uh, Fitzy, Wolf, and Wulzleger in 2004 uh, had a result uh, that looked at using correlated sources in order to realize, realize broadcast. And the topic of this talk is exactly this, uh, that of using correlated sources to get broadcast. So three-party broadcast has implications to n-party broadcast and n-party MPC. A result by uh, Fitzy and Morrill from 2000 states that if every subset of three parties among the n parties can do broadcast, then we can indeed get n-party broadcast with honest uh, majority. Now, um, there are classic results that say that if we have broadcast, then we can get general MPC with honest majority. So one of the consequences of our results is that we get a sufficient condition for uh, MPC with honest majority uh, in terms of the kind of correlations that we can use for uh, realizing this. 
So interestingly, you would need three wise correlations to get this kind of a result, and we will be looking at three wise correlations. So let's look at the um, problem statement. We want Byzantine broadcast using correlated sources. So let's call the three parties A, B, and C, and A is the sender, and they are connected by a, a communication network. Additionally, A gets random variables x1 to xn, B gets y1 to yn, and C gets z1 to zn, such that each triple xi, yi, zi is identically and independently distributed according to a fixed correlation, uh, p, x, y, z. Now our problem is which correlations p, x, y, z given sufficiently many copies of, uh, sufficiently many samples from it can be used to build a protocol that realizes three-party broadcast. So like I was mentioning earlier, uh, this problem was previously looked at by Fitzy et al. In their 2004 work, they uh, presented a uh, characterization of the correlations that would allow you to uh, get broadcast. This uh, characterization was in terms of a notion called simulatability that is given uh, in, in, in this uh, slide. We will look at what these conditions mean at a later time. So what they did is they presented a protocol that is a, a non-interactive protocol that realizes broadcast whenever one of these two simulatability conditions is broken. And further, they claim that if both the simulatability conditions are satisfied for a correlation, then you cannot use it to realize uh, broadcast. However, it turns out that uh, the impossibility proof was incorrect, and indeed there are simple to describe correlations that can be used to, th that satisfies both the simulatability conditions, but can still be used to realize broadcast. The trick is to use interaction. So in our work, we give uh, the correct characterization for uh, broadcast using correlated sources. And this is uh, in terms of this notion called simulatability with interaction. As you can see, interaction plays a, a significant role here. Um, and we show a matching impossibility, uh, showing that this is a necessary and sufficient condition. So uh, let me begin by uh, looking at the protocol from Fitzy et al. Et al's paper, uh, as this would be the starting point for our construction too. They build the protocol for broadcast using uh, the notion of pseudo-signatures. Let's first see what a pseudo-signature is. A pseudo-signature in the direction A to B to C is a way for A to send a signed message to B, which then B can reliably transfer to C. So we need all the natural uh, signature-like properties. First of all, if B is honest, then it would accept a valid signature from A. And if B was provided a valid signature that it has accepted, then B can be confident that when it forwards this signature to C, C will accept it as long as C is honest. And finally, when C uh, receives a signed message and it checks out in the verification, then C can be confident that it is a message signed by A. Uh, specifically, it has not been forged by B. So these are natural uh, notions that we would need for a signature. And here is an intuitive way to build uh, pseudo-signatures using correlations. So note that x, y, and z, they are connected because they are correlated. So the, the signature that uh, the sender uses will be a function of both the message and the, their part of the correlation, that is xn. So now uh, b can verify the signature by checking whether this is consistent with their share, that is yn. Similarly, C can verify when B forwards it to them uh, whether it is consistent with ZN. And it turns out this is how the signature is built in the 2004 paper. Now, given a pseudo signature with these properties, it's rather easy to build a broadcast protocol. So how does it work? A sends the message along with the signature to B. If the signature checks out, B outputs M and forwards this uh, message signature pair to C. If uh, the signature checks out at C, then C can be confident that this is the message sent by A. This follows from the unforgeability property. So C outputs M. 
if uh, the signature was found to be false, then C can be confident that this is a forgery from a failed forgery from B. So in this case, C can go ahead and ask Alice for the message and simply output whatever Alice sends. Finally, if the verification had failed at B itself, then uh, B can go ahead and be sure that A has been malicious. So choose C to be a trusted party. So C asks A for the message and forwards it to B, and there's a typo here. So B outputs what uh, C forwarded. So now the question is, when can you, what kind of correlations can you use to realize pseudo signature? So as we saw, we want the simulatability condition to not hold. So what is non-simulatability? It's this condition over here. It says some quantity, x down arrow y, should, be, should not be independent of z conditioned on y. So what is x down arrow y? So it turns, it, this, seems, this turns out to be a quantity that has been studied earlier, and it's called the minimal sufficient statistic of y given x. So intuitively, this is the largest part of x that can be statistically verified using y. So what does this mean? So given several copies, y1 up to yn, that b has, b can detect if a incorrectly reports many values among x down arrow, x1 down arrow y1 up to xn down arrow y1, yn. So in a sense, this is the largest part of x that uh, y can verify when, x, when somebody might be lying about x. So it turns out to be a rather straightforward function, and it's intuitive why this works out. So let's call it, so I, I'll be calling it x down arrow y. So let's say this is psi of x. Then psi of x evaluates to the same value for two different x's, x1 and x2, if and only if the distribution of y conditioned on x1 is identical to distribution of y conditioned on x2. This is like they are indistinguishable conditioned on either of these uh, values, realizations. Now what is the non-simulatability condition claiming? It's claiming that uh, this uh, x down arrow y quantity, uh, c can use z to catch uh, b uh, if uh, this x down arrow y quantity has been forged using y. So this is a necessary and sufficient condition, this the lack of independence. It's clear to see, it's easy to see why this is necessary, because if x down arrow y was independent of z conditioned on y, then you can indeed use y to forge x down arrow y. And it turns out the converse is true, that is if this d condition is not s satisfied, then you can, I mean, then B, C uh, with access to Z can statistically check whether X down arrow Y has been correctly reported. Now, uh, this, is the proper, this is the properties that are used in the 2004 paper to get a protocol for broadcast by, via the pseudo signatures when this condition is not, I mean, when the simulatability condition is not satisfied. Now, why is it that this is not sufficient? Uh, I, I mean, necessary. It turns out that before starting uh, this kind of a pseudo signature based protocol, uh, A can potentially upgrade C. By this, I mean that A sends the largest part of X that C can verify so that C can add to its uh, arsenal more than just ZN. It can add things from A. So, what is the largest part that C can verify from A. It's the same quantity that we previously saw. It's x down arrow z. So the protocol goes by first uh, A sending this quantity. And if it is verified now, C has been upgraded to this larger correlation. And then you can run the protocol, uh, the, the previous protocol that we have been discussing. And if uh, the verification fails, then C knows that A is corrupt. So it can ask B to be the trusted party and carry on the broadcast. So now uh, it turns out that there are simple correlations where this kind of an up update is necessary. And this is exactly why the, the, there is a gap between the necessary and sufficient condition over there in the 2004 paper. So, so now we have uh, a, an updated 
uh, source for car uh, C. But it turns out you can do these kind of upgrades much more aggressively by letting A and B interact with C. Uh, in this manner, C can keep building uh, its knowledge about X in a very verifiable manner until it's, it reaches this quantity called X down arrow Z infinity, which is the largest quantity that you can verifiably upgrade to. So uh, one thing to note is that even though um, this is done in steps, this is done in steps in, the, in, in C's head, but the communication that is required for this is, uh, um, is only one round with A and B. Next, we can also ask whether why not upgrade B also, uh, like we did C. And here we should be slightly more careful. Uh, upgrading B will allow B to verify a larger part of X. This makes the verification part easy. But then it also allows B to forge more convincingly towards C. As a result, uh, we need to do this more carefully. So how it is done is, C upgrades B only on randomly chosen locations, which are not known to A. And this allows C to verify the signature that is coming from A. However, because uh, B does not know the values, the upgrades on several of these indices, it will not be able to forge the signature uh, except by using just Y and not the upgraded part. So, uh, we call the conditions that we get from these two upgrades, the uh, ABC non-simulatability with interaction. So when this condition is satisfied by a correlation, uh, we can run a protocol which upgrades C and B, and then eventually runs the protocol for broadcast using pseudo-signature that we previously saw using these upgraded correlations. Now, if the simulatability condition is not satisfied in the other direction, ACB, then we can run a very similar protocol, but with the roles of C and B interchanged. This way we get uh, a positive result, and it turns out that we can show that this result is, uh, um, I mean, this condition of simulatability is also necessary, non-simulatability, that is. So if both simulatability conditions are met, then it's impossible to realize uh, broadcast. So how do we prove this? We start with the uh, impossibility of broadcast among three parties without setup. Uh, this is a very interesting and elegant proof by uh, FLM. Uh, yeah, and, and then, uh, so how does this proof work? It connects uh, several copies of the same parties and then make them run honestly the protocols of the purported broadcast protocol. And then you argue uh, several ways of interpreting this particular run and uh, realize that this will always lead to a contradiction. Now, what we do is we generalize this particular argument to the uh, source correlation model. So for this, uh, we uh, when, whenever the necessary conditions are not satisfied, we come up with this joint distribution of X, Y, and Z, which can be provided to these parties to conveniently reach a FLM-style uh, impossibility. So to summarize, we looked at the characterization of correlations which permit three-party broadcasts. We realized that the earlier simulatability-based uh, condition does not hold and we replaced it with a simulatability with interaction condition. Uh, our construction uses these, uh, you know, b b these steps of slowly upgrading the uh, correlations of both parties A and B and C and so on. Uh, yeah, and uh, to show the negative result, we extended the FLM argument to uh, source correlations. And it turns out this particular argument could go through even for the channel-like setup. Finally, um, it turns out that the same characterization that we just saw applies even for the feasibility of pseudo-signatures. In order to show this, we build a protocol that reverses the direction of pseudo-signatures from ABC to ACB. This is uh, an interesting construction that you can look into the paper for. 
Uh, and another point to note is that the security error of this protocol is going to be a negligible function of n. So it's efficient and it has constant number of rounds. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Um, thank you for the nice talk. We have time for a short question. If there's one, we. But the other, so. Uh, oh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I wonder what's a practical imp implementation of correlated sources. I mean, um, as in, so OT correlations would be a practical implementation. I mean, uh, using OT correlation for realizing. Cryptographic oh, primitives would but be... A, that's but not like the noisy version you talked about, right? Uh, no, I mean, so over here, the correlations could be any kind of correlation. So one, one interesting correlation could be just the Rabin OT, which is like a random bit at one... Rabin OT correlation is a random bit at one side and erasure on the other side with probability half. But it's worth noting that we need a three-wise correlation at least to realize broadcast. Okay, thank you. We, re we need to move on to the next talk. Thank you, Varun. So, next speaker, next talk is Privacy Preserving Blueprints from Markul Kolweis, Anna Lizanskaya, and Anne Guyen, and Mark Wolf will give the talk. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Okay, yeah, welcome to my talk, and thanks for the introduction. So I started off with uh, hand-drawn slides, but I made the slides much nicer, also thanks to uh, nice pictures from George Oswell Marson, and uh, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so to set the stage, so this talk is kind of set in a, in a not too far future where we made even more progress than we already did in doing anonymous transactions. And uh, so we have a user that interacts with a verifier and he, he might use anonymous credentials or perfectly anonymous channels and the like. So we made technical progress, but um, we might not have made that much social progress. That usually takes uh, um, much longer. So even in that world, there are some people that uh, need to be audited. And uh, so there's an authority that might have to investigate crimes and the like. So that authority might say that in order to protect us from terrorists or to protect our children, it needs to see a lot of information about our transactions. So verifiers typically are, are business people. They want to be like within the frame of law. So they want to make sure that that authority gets to see what they need to see. And in addition, they might need some policy to be satisfied. So here's an example. So for instance, the auditor might need to see some unique identifier of the user so they can look up um, the user in the database, while the verifier might just be happy with um, knowing that the user is older than 21 or not in the European Union because there the privacy um, regulations are, are too strict. That was kind of a joke, but yeah. <laughs> so um, users often um, are quite apathetic about privacy. I think the reason for that is often that they, that they currently don't have uh, like much of a choice, and they also value free services, and of course, they also care about their kids. However, I think um, often bad things happen, and we kind of realize that our world is not constantly moving towards more democracy, so there's, there are risks in having um, too much infringement by authorities. So users might think that, yes, privacy is a human right. I want to protect that. But I still need the service of, uh, that the verifier offers. So Phil Rogovic complained that we always use these cute um, attackers in our talks. So that's why I put up this uh, sticker here for the NSA. And a lot of this talk is, of course, motivated by the Snowden revelations. So our goal is to kind of make all sides um, happy or at least equally unhappy. And so what is our goal? So the auditor 
knows some secret information that he uses to investigate crimes. Let's denote that by X. For instance, this might be a list of suspects. So the user has uh, attributes. Um, let's focus on Y being the user's identity, for instance, his social security number, or some other unique identity. And the verifier kind of can interact with users, but only if, if the auditor gets to see a function of um, X, the suspect list, and the um, user's attributes for his identity. And then additionally, the policy that his business policy must be met. So let's look at, at a concrete, um, ah, yeah. so what are the, the goals that we want to achieve? So we want, um, the auditor wants to keep his kind of suspect list private, so X should be only known to him. And um, we want that the auditor only gets to see F of X, Y, but nothing about Y, especially for, for honest users. Um, the user kind of only gets to see F, so he knows what the auditing policy is, but he doesn't know the secret input of the auditor. And he accepts that the auditor gets to see F of X of Y for some committed X or encrypted X of the auditor. So here is a concrete example that we call a watch list. So in a watch list, the function f of x, y is y if the user is a suspect. So if y is in the list of suspects, then it, this function behaves like the identity function. And otherwise, it behaves like the constant function, doesn't reveal anything about the user's information. So what we do is we design a cryptographic primitive that um, allows us to achieve this, that allows the auditor to learn f of x, y, but nothing else. So that primitive is modeled um, and on, on public key encryption because that's something that we kind of understand quite well and that we hope can, can be, um, that developers or people that use this scheme can understand. So there's a key generation algorithm that takes the auditor sequence information x as input and produces a key pair where the public key encodes um, the secret information but hides it. So the green boxes always denote um, ciphertext or something that hides the, the information in the box. So that public key is made available to users and it's important to note that all users use the same public key. So a user will then create an escrow using that public key and his um, attribute information or his identity Y and that results in an escrow value of f of x, y. That is sent to the verifier. The verifier can, can check that the escrow is correctly formed, but does not actually get to see anything. So this is a ciphertext. The verifier doesn't get to see anything. But on request, the auditor can request, uh, can obtain the escrow and decrypt it to learn f of x, y, but nothing else. So this is kind of the syntax of our scheme. So I oversimplified it a little bit to kind of introduce complexity gradually. In reality, the syntax is a bit more uh, complex. So we add um, an, an, an commitment scheme. And so the, 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 the reason for that complexity is that we also want to kind of watch the watchman. We want to um, check some information about the X without actually learning the X. And we also want to integrate the this blueprint scheme with anonymous credentials. And for that, we use external commitments. But more about that um, after I summarize our contributions. <clears throat> so our contributions are fourfold. So um, our main contribution is actually to introduce this primitive. So, and we want it to be as simple as possible. And as I mentioned, that primitive should be easily integratable with anonymous credentials, or also eCash, or anonymous um, payment systems such as Zcash. So we give a, a formal notion, which is simulation-based, but we, um, we, it's also property-based. So there are multiple properties that describe um, what, uh, what the auditor and the user's security requirements are. And then we give an efficient instantiation based on decisional diffie Hellman. It's based on Elgamal and Sigma proofs. And we, here we use a, a notion of, uh, we also show how to instantiate the zero-knowledge proofs, and we introduce a concept of partial straight-line extraction, which is a relaxation of straight-line extraction, which allows for more efficiency. Last but not least, we also show how to obtain um, blueprints 
for all functions from FHG and generic non-interactive zero knowledge and also from non-interactive secure computation. So I will not be able to go into, the, into, into all the details, but more information can be found in our paper. So there is, of course, a lot of related work. So this builds on a long tradition of um, cryptographic work that tries to kind of balance privacy and accountability, starting with uh, David Chaum in the 80s. So he worked on his famous paper on the card computer. He also worked on group signatures, which is a closely related primitive, and then worked by Karmenisch and Lucien Skyer, and a lot of, many of their collaborators and many other groups um, on anonymous credentials. And the latest hype or instantiation of this is in self-sovereign self um, identity management. <coughs> so there are several um, closely related works, one by Green, Corruption, and Lea, the ARLEA system, which stands for Abuse Resistant Law Enforcement Access Control, from which we actually took the inspiration for our non-interactive secure computation construction. And also worked by Goldwasser and Park, which looked at public account accountability versus secret laws, and they asked whether they can coexist. In general, all this line of work um, answers the question of whether privacy and accountability can, can be balanced in a positive way. So this is possible. So there's also, there was also a paper, um, I think, on Tuesday, which uh, showed how this can be done for the traceability of group signatures. So this is also close, closely related work and would love to hear from you guys. Good, so let's um, look at the integration with anonymous credentials. So this is the kind of the simplified syntax. So in order to integrate things, we um, have external commitment parameters and um, we generate a setup based on those parameters. Now we give an opening to a commitment to the secret values X and Y to the keychain and escrow algorithms. So by that, um, the, the, uh, we, we have uh, that um, we obtain a commitment to X that corresponds to the X in the public key. And the keychain algorithm will prove that, um, that this commitment contains the same value as the public key. And this can then be verified using the public key verification algorithm. So if we now do an external commit and proof, zero knowledge proof that this committed value has nice properties, for instance, that it contains only um, suspects for which there's a variant, then we can keep the auditor more accountable. Similarly, we add a commitment to the um, escrow algorithm which is verified by the verifier. And this, is, this, is pos this allows us to bind Y to existing anonymous credential schemes. So we define uh, security of blueprints, as I mentioned, um, using kind of simulation-based but property-based definitions. So we have three properties. One is blueprint hiding, which guarantees that <coughs> the value X of the auditor is hidden both from the user and the verifier. So we have soundness, which guarantees that if the public key um, X verifies with a commitment CY, then it actually decrypts to F of XY. The third property guarantees security for both the auditor and for the user, because it guarantees that both X and Y are, are hidden in the escrow towards external parties. And the last property is maybe the one that the user cares the most about because it says that even if the secret key of the auditor is uh, used against him, all that can be learned is f of x, y. So this, <clears throat> I look into the, the last property um, in, in a bit more detail now. So how do we define this? As I mentioned, it is simulation based. So we have a real world and an ideal world. So we have the same adversary in both worlds and that adversary kind of obtains the setup. He then produces a public key and a commitment, kind of commitment opening to that public key. And the same happens in the ideal world, except that there we use a simulated setup. So we now require that that public key verifies with respect to the commitment 
computed with that opening. So this models that when verification fails, a user will not use um, the public key, and so he will not encrypt his information. So if verification fails, we abort the experiment. So now let's assume that verification is successful. So then we require that, no that an escrow reveals no information except f of x, y. And we model this using simulation. So in the real world, the adversary can choose any user value y and randomness r prime, and he obtains the honestly computed escrow. While in the ideal world, he obtains a simulated escrow where the simulator only gets to see a commitment to y and f of x, y, so the value f of x, y. And as this commitment typically would be like a Pedersen commitment scheme that this information is really hiding, this models that really no information is revealed about except for f of x, y. Okay, let's speed up a bit. So we have a generic construction from Blueprint which follows um, a very typical um, recipe which lifts um, passively secure, um, non-interactive, uh, uh, passively secure computation to actively secure computation. So in our setting, that means that we have a non-interactive secure computation of F that is passively secure. And then we use zero knowledge proofs to lift this to active security and add these commitments to the inputs. In our constructions, for all functions, we obtain the passive security from circuit private functional uh, fully homomorphic encryption or from non-interactive secure computation. Our efficient construction for watch lists is based on lifted algamal. So I will um, look into the details of um, lifted algamal. And there, um, we also use, as I mentioned, this partial straight, li straight line extractable proofs of knowledge, which may, might be of independent interest to get efficient sigma proofs. So let's recall the watch list uh, function. So it says that the function f of xy returns y if y is in the list of suspects and the empty string otherwise. So I first will describe decryption, which is just trial decryption in a sense. So I, I get an escrow, I decrypt it using an Elgamal um, secret key, and then I check if the value y is in a list of suspects, which is also part of the secret key, and in that case I return y, otherwise I return epsilon. So how do we get that value into, um, into the escrow? So we use a, a nice trick based on polynomials. So we encode the list of xi values um, into the roots of a polynomial, which we then also randomize. So we get a, a random polynomial with uh, roots at xi. So we represent that polynomial, so three minutes left. So we represent that polynomial using its coefficients and we encrypt um, those coefficients and add those encrypted coefficients to the public key. So in order to form an escrow, we evaluate the polynomial at the user's value, user's identity y, which means that we get uh, a zero value if y is in the list and some non-zero value otherwise. And this can then be used to encrypt. So we pick a, a randomizer S prime, we multiply that value with S prime. So if it was a zero value, then it is still zero, and we can add the user's identity to it. And if it was non-zero, then it will be completely randomized. We add um, the identity to it, which is then hidden. It's like a one-time path uh, type encryption. So yeah, so that uh, sums up our scheme. I think it's, it's really quite simple, which I think is a good thing, because one of the challenges when implementing uh, mechanisms like that is that they might be subverted or there might be a backdoor inserted, so this code, if we indeed decide to use it, would have to be very carefully audited because, um, but I think any software can be subverted, so in some sense that, um, but yeah, so that's crucial. So let's wrap up. So the motivation is that um, we wanted to find a 
sensible trade-off between privacy and accountability. So we don't have to choose between um, whether we want security or privacy. We only have to choose what the function f should be and how we want to certify x and y. And um, we give strong definitions. Um, it's an interesting question whether we can obtain um, universal composition. Um, I think it, it might be possible, um, but efficiency might suffer. So it might, doing this like very efficiently might be like a bit of a challenge still. And then we gave constructions both for specific functions and for um, all general functions. Okay, thank you, Marco, for the nice talks. Any questions? Okay, so I, there's no question. So I will ask something. Um, so the, the constructions you give um, for white slits is quite efficient. Um, and is there any other function that you think might make sense to consider that might also give um, good instantiations? Mm -hmm. So in, in our paper, we actually give a, a more general function, which also reveals some additional auxiliary information about the user. So here, we just reveal the, the identity, but actually you can have additional auxiliary information that is revealed when there is a matching. So that's one thing we had. Um, it's an interesting question, which um, our, our generic construction using FHE, what could be done there, some kind of risk assessment and things like that. I think that that's also something we're looking at, um, for instance, that you might ramp up some kind of risk score, and if that gets too high, then one gets uh, de de-anonymized. Okay, thank you. I think we need to move on to mm -hmm. the next talk. Thank you very much. So, um, next talk will be by Hamza Abuzala, who will join work with Valerio Zini, and it's an incremental proof of sequential work for general weight distributions. Okay, hi, thanks everybody. Um, so this is joint work with <coughs> Valerio Ceni. Um, the outline of my talk will be roughly the following. I will give definitions for boost of sequential work schemes in the standalone sitting, and then give you an instantiation based on the skip this uh, construction uh, graph. Uh, then we move on to definition of incremental proof of sequential work schemes and I give you and show you how to make this construction, the skip this construction incremental. And then uh, we show how to generalize this incremental scheme to work for general uh, weight distributions. These are motivated by blockchain applications. Um, all constructions that I deal with uh, are in the random oracle model. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, what is a proof of sequential work scheme? It's an interactive protocol between a prover and verifier. Uh, when the prover does in sequential steps, uh, in sequential queries to its Oracle tau, think of the Oracle tau as a random Oracle, then it makes the verifier accept. Um, and to make things more interesting, we, the proof should be succinct and should verify fast. Otherwise, it would be trivial. Soundness says that a malicious prover that does at most alpha n sequential queries alpha fraction, a fraction alpha of the sequential queries will make the verifier reject, accept only with probability epsilon, even if it has massive amount of parallelism. So you have to do the work sequentially if you have any hope to convince the verifier. Okay? Uh, all proofs of sequential work schemes uh, look the same. Um, they are parameterized by a graph and, and another parameter t. The verifier sends uh, a chi to the prover that the prover uses to solve its random oracle, and then use the random oracle, the salted random oracle, to compute the labeling of the graph in topological order. And the label of the ith node is the oracle applied to the ith index and the label of its parents. Once the prover does this, it sends the label of the sink of the graph to the verifier. It, uh, <coughs> sorry. This functions as uh, a commitment to the labels, and then they engage in a challenge response phase, after which the verifier accepts or rejects. Concretely, the skip list, the skip list proof of sequential work scheme uh, works like this. You have a skip list graph, and now we instantiate the challenge response phase. So assume you have a challenge five. What the prover does, it locates the shortest path that goes from the source to the sink, 
and, pass it and passes through five. And then it sends to the verifier the labels on this, on this path and the labels of its parents. The verifier does this uh, three many times and it accepts if the, if the labeling is consistent. It is int instructive to say that, uh, that even though it looks in this example that the prover sends the entire graph, this is a short, uh, this is a short example, so asymptotically this, is, uh, this achieves succinctness because the, the shortest path is of logar logarithmic length and the end degree of the graph is logarithmic. So all things check out. Uh, to give you a taste of what the probability is of the malicious prover, the malicious prover that does um, alpha and sequential queries will succeed, and in total does Q queries to, to the oracle, will succeed in, in convincing the verifier with this blue probability, which is alpha to the power of t, plus some probability that amounts to finding collisions in the random oracle. This is also, I wanted to show you how the t plays into this probability and the efficiency, okay? All this is uh, known. Um, now I want to show, we want to move to the incremental world. And before that, I want to show you the limitations of these existing proof of sequential work schemes, what I call standalone proof of sequential work schemes. The prover has actually two extreme strategies. Either it stores the labels of the entire graph, and then it, expand, it expends no extra computation to answer challenges, or it stores nothing, and it has to do in the worst case, in sequential steps, extra in sequential steps to answer the challenges. Uh, but luckily, there is a space-time trade-off uh, that was known for the CB graph on the left, and we show the same hold also for the skip list. Uh, and this shows, like roughly speaking, for an example here, the prover can store, say, square root of n labels, and, uh, and then can answer challenges with an extra square root of n sequential work. But can we do better? Can we get the best of, of both worlds, meaning that the prover does in sequential steps, stores essentially nothing, a succinct state, and requires no extra computation to answer its challenges? This is where incremental proof, uh, proofs of sequential work come, uh, come in handy. Uh, these are defined then interactively right away. Uh, the prover and the verifier uh, form a, a proof of sequential work scheme, complete, sound, and, and succinct, and we have an extra algorithm, increment algorithm, the increment algorithm, once it receives here um, a proof for parameter n1 and another parameter n2, it generates and increments the proof um, by doing n2 sequential computation and provides a proof for n1 plus n2. In particular, this proof generation is independent of n1, should only depend on n2. And this should succeed with uh, the, the, proof, uh, the, the initial proof that it was given was um, computed honestly or maliciously. As long as it's an accepting proof, it should be able to, be, to, to increment it. This is important in distributed applications where maybe one party is doing the part of the computation and the other party wants to, to increment it. Um, and this uh, should hold, succinctness should hold no matter how many incrementation, uh, for arbitrary many incrementation, okay? The proof should still be succinct. Otherwise, you can concatenate proofs and everything is trivial and meaningless. Cool. Uh, so, Dotling, Lai, and Malavolta, who introduced the notion, also gave a construction based on the CB graph, um, the CB proof of sequential work scheme, by devising um, a neat uh, on the fly sampling technique. Uh, their construction incurs an extra security loss, but not much, and it's good, and we achieve the same, the same thing. So, what we do here in this work, we show that the same thing can be achieved for the skip list graph by applying the same technique and re reaching the same conclusions. But what we actually do and the motivation of this work is to generalize this incremental proof sequential work scheme to work for general weight distributions uh, because this uh, gives us applica interesting applications in blockchains. And for this, we need to devise a new variant of the on-the-fly sampling technique and um, modify the protocol a bit to be able to prove security. So let's get into these two, two steps. <coughs> So here is the, the, the standalone incremental proof of sequential work scheme. So for t is equal to four, what the prover does, it computes, it labels the first two consecutive sets of size four. And then what it does, it wants to generate a subset. Now it uses the randomness of the sink to select a random subset of size t from these two subsets. All good, so it chose this uh, random subset and what it stores, it stores proofs for these challenges. Uh, 
In particular, whatever was not chosen in the set will never be part of the challenge, the final challenge of, of the prover. Okay? And it's, uh, it's worth noting that uh, the, the prover can actually generate these proofs because in the previous step, it had all the labels of the graph, so it can generate the proofs. Okay, this is important to keep, uh, keep in mind. For example, for the challenge pi one will be the path that passes through one from the source to the sink in, in, the, in the left graph uh, and, and its parents. I'm dropping the parents for the sake of il illustration. Uh, the same we do on the, on the right side, and we have these two sets, uh, and now we want to select again a set of size four, a random set of size four from these two subsets. We use the randomness of, uh, of the sink, and we do that. All that's fine, but the thing that doesn't follow trivially is that we need to form to kind of, we have proofs on the left side and proofs on the right side, and we need to generate proofs in the big graph, okay? But this is thanks to the graph structure of this graph, this is doable. So assume that you have pi one, you are giving this from the left uh, set, and you want to extend it to a proof in the larger graph. All what you really need is this extra edge, because this will be the shortest path in the, in the, largest, in the large graph. And thanks to the proofs on the right side, they all pass through the sink by definition, they will contain this extra edge. So a proof can actually be, be extended from the smaller left graph to the bigger graph, and by symmetry you can do this for, for the right graph. So the prover can, can do the sampling and compute the proofs, everything checks out. Um, the increment algorithm works exactly like the honest prover, so nothing needs to be said about it, but the, the verifier is now having a, a more challenging task. So it, it will be served, uh, say here, T proofs, four proofs, it, look, it looks at each one individually, and each one of them should verify according to the standalone proof of sequential work scheme, so the consistency of the labels on the shortest path should, should, be, should be met. But it also has to, to verify that these challenges were actually consi are consistent with the on-the-fly sampling technique. For this, the prover will generate an extra index set, and then the verifier can recursively um, check these on-the-fly samplings. Um, it's a bit more detailed, but doesn't have extra information. But I, what I wanna highlight is that at each step of, uh, of the verification, the verifier knows all these left and right sets from which we sampled a smaller set. They were implicitly defined, and they're always of size t, exactly t. This will not be the case when we move to general weight distributions. These things will be an expectation, and this will, will, could potentially give a malicious prover a chance to, to cheat, and we need to deal with that. Um, soundness of the whole protocol will follow in, in a modular way. You first bound the advantage of the on-the-fly sampling, and then you reduce security the, to the standalone proof of sequential work scheme. Why we need to think about this, like, uh, like uh, remember the, the prover when it was computing, at some point in the computation it knew that it will never be challenged on some of the vertices. Could this give the prover extra power or not? One has to analyze that, okay? Um, the analysis will be like, like on a high level, what you need to prove is a lemma like, like this, is saying that, well, if, uh, if a prover has a fraction of inconsistent um, nodes, these are the nodes that it will not be able to convince the verifier of, uh, then this fraction will not be that much, uh, that much different if the verifier chose the challenges in one shot or if it chose them according to the on-the-fly sampling. Will be, the fraction will be close, okay? And this can be pro proven very simply from a Hofting pound, uh, and this was also done in previous work, and we applied the same, and things will check out. This comes at an extra slight cost of, um, uh, in, in the success probability. So in the previous case, we had uh, this bound below, and say that the blue, the, the, the black um, uh, summons, they are almost the same, and we can compare the blue ones. Uh, what is different in this new technique? It adds this log n factor that is squared in the, in the exponent of E. This seems inherent to the, to the churn of bound, the way that you apply the, the bound, it would be nice if one can remove it, but this was in previous work and we inherited it because of the technique. Okay, uh, now the, the interesting case is that the general weight distributions, um, <coughs> maybe I can skip this slide and go right away to this. Uh, in some applications uh, in the blockchain, where you use uh, proofs of sequential work schemes to, uh, to solve some problems in light client uh, bootstrapping, for example, in a paper that we had on an Asia crypt called Snacks, which are succinct and interactive arguments of chain knowledge. 
Um, somehow, you, the verifier needs to be able to challenge the prover on, on nodes, but not all nodes are equal. You need to be able to, to challenge on, on nodes uh, close to the tip of the chain with higher probability than nodes deep in the chain. So that's not a uniform distribution, but it looks like this. So each, uh, each node will have uh, a weight, and the sum of the weights will be one. So it kind of reflects uh, the, the, the challenge distribution. And we want to, our incremental algorithm to work with this distribution, for example. Uh, how do we do this? Here we have to change the on-the-fly sampling a bit. Uh, so, okay, we have this distribution. We computed the first four uh, the first two sets. Now I'm showing only the line, not the entire graph, because otherwise it would be messy. So imagine this is a skip this graph. Um, so you add to your subset uh, a node. You look at a node, and with probability that is proportional to its weight, t times its weight, you add it to the set with this probability, okay? And we do this because, and you look on the next node and, uh, and so on. And you do this because you want, in the end, you, you want to get some, uh, that the sampled subset is of size t, but here an expectation, okay? You do this also on the right side. Uh, <clears throat> we, can, we know that these proofs can be merged for the skip this graph easily, so there's no issue. And now we want to sample from the bigger graph. And luckily we can do this because this kind of the blue, the, the, the distribution, the, the curve for the larger graph um, is lying below these two, 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 two curves, which means that we have enough probability mass to resample. Um, but you can imagine if you have different distributions, say the, 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 um, the Gaussian distribution, then this will not be incrementable. Um, so we characterize these distributions that can be incremented in this way, and we call them t-incrementally assemblable distributions, a very simple uh, definition. And then we show that for any such distribution, the skip this construction is, uh, is incremental. Um, that covers, of course, the snack distribution and the uniform distribution, which shows that the technique is, is a generalization of the existing technique. But uh, new challenges, we need to resolve new challenges. Um, the challenges come precisely because in the standalone case, the sampling sets are already always implicitly defined and are of size t, while in our case, things are an expectation. Um, and because of that, we, we need to first to give these sets, we, we modify the protocol a bit, and we make the prover first commit to these sampling uh, sets in a tree-like fashion. And then we, whenever the prover is giving a proof, it has to provide these sampling sets uh, that relate to this proof uh, explicitly. And these will be an opening in this Merkle tree, which will add to the size of the proof, but still uh, efficient. Uh, and then hopefully the verifier will essentially recursively be able to check the consistency of, of these sampling. It has to do an extra, extra checks related to that these sets are, um, are, you know, their size does not deviate that much from the expectation and so on. Uh, all, I'm almost concluding. So the soundness now, we need to bound the advantage of this malicious prover because now the malicious prover could choose these sets in maliciously, could drop uh, some elements from them because they're not of size t exactly, an expectation, so you could probably cheat a bit here and there. Uh, so you wanna make sure that this does not give the adversary um, uh, much, uh, much advantage. Um, and then we need to generalize the on-the-fly sampling to work for these uh, t incrementally sampleable distributions, and then we can reduce security to the underlying proof of sequence work scheme. In the paper, we give bounds for any such distributions, and we give concrete bounds for the uniform distribution and the snack distribution. And I will stop here. I have extra slides, by the way. Maybe if you have a question, I have some slides already ready. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice talk, Hamza. Are there questions from the audience? Um. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Just a quick question about, uh, you mentioned that the security is analyzed in the random oracle model. Is it also analyzed uh, in the quantum random oracle model? Good question. I don't know. No, it's not. But uh, but these proof of sequential work schemes, there is work on on them in the quantum uh, random oracle model. But uh, this work does not deal with that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. If there are no more questions, I think we need to change back. Thank you, and it's over.